Ekwa. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Zika. You know, Ekwa and I have a history, and, and I can't start this without talking about the history. I've known Ekwa since she was 14 years at Ghana <laughs> International School, and Ekwa will tell the story. Yeah, I mean, it's, I remember <laughs> you sitting in your, your counseling room, and we'd come and see you about various issues, and then eventually going to university, coming to talk to you. And then I, you kind of disappeared. I didn't <laughs> see you for years. <laughs> you also then, disappeared. You went well, to the States. Exactly. I went to the States, went to university. And then I remember one day um, when I was working at Bost, mm -hmm. I'd had the procurement team do finish up some work. And they said, oh, we've made a selection. So I said, yeah, sure. And then they said, oh, the person wants to meet you. So I said, OK. And you know, I was busy working. So when you walked in, I actually didn't lift up my head just yet. So I looked up and I thought, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, I couldn't believe it. And I was so glad I wasn't part of the procurement process yeah, because yeah. they, oh, you picked then her you up. You picked your counselor. I tell you. Uh -huh. But, you know, ever since then, it's been amazing. The things you've helped me through. Um, it's, I mean, this is what, six, seven years ago that, seven, that we reconnected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and we've uh, known each other for 34 years. For 34, 34 years. years. Yes, so yes, she's yes, yes. from a 14 year old now, a 40, 40, 46. Six beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> I keep saying she's a reverend with a swag. <laughs> so, it was. Yes. yes. Huh. Today we are going to talk about the last module mm. and the last topic, which is um, flying at Mach 5. Yes. And the Mach is called, people have asked me, is it Mach 5? I have myself. <laughs> and they corrected me. And, and the, the term flying at Mark 5 came from you, yes. actually. We were engaging in that, you know, a, a conversation, and she said something, and she said, I want to fly at Mark 5. <laughs> then I picked it. I said, This is going to become the module name, and she's going to talk about it. So, if I share with us, what, what does flying at Mark 5 mean? So, you know, Mark 5, so Mark speeds are speeds that are higher than the speed of sound, they're faster than the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. And I remember I used to have a professor and he would always say to me, you know, sometimes he'd be doing, he'd be grading my work and he'd say, oh yeah, you know, you're doing well. And other times he's like, oh, I used to fly at Mach 5, but now, you know, I'm not really seeing your show. <laughs> so that's when I picked up sort of the expression of flying at Mach 5. But essentially what it is, is, is if you think about an airplane, you know, mm -hmm. something that is flying, yeah. okay. The speed of sound is amazing. I mean, if you think about the, the time you see lightning, versus the time you hear the thunder. I mean, that's it. That's mm. sound, mm -hmm. okay? And there are things that fly faster than that. And I mean, max speeds go all the way up to Mach 22, you know? And she's crazy. an engineer too, so you Oh, can... yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm an engineer, so. <laughs> well, max speeds go all the way, 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 way up to, into their 20s. But for me, flying at Mach 5 is, you know, coming to that place where you are completely liberated. You mm. know, you're not held back by you know, the, you've overcome wind, you've overcome sound, you've overcome dust and, you know, all the things that will sort of hinder a person mm -hmm. and, and you are just going, you know, you are doing you and, I mean, the rest of the world watching is like, whoa, what's happening? <laughs> you know, but for you, you're just in the zone. Mm -hmm. And that for me is what yes. Mach 5 Mark means, five. yeah. You said you are doing you. Yes, you're doing you. And I presume doing you is becoming your best self. Yes, I mean, you're, you're everything that God intended you to be. That, mm -hmm. that for me is doing you, you know. You're not doing anybody else. You're not trying to be like anyone else. You're not holding yourself back, you know, in an effort to please other people. You're not held back by fear. You are everything. You know, like the Nike advert, be all that you can be. <laughs> no, it's actually the U.S. The Army. US, yeah. It says be all that you can be, you know. So you're really just being your full self without being held back by anything. Hmm. So how would you relate this to some of the modules in Becoming My Best Self? Mm. Two or three of them. How okay. can you relate this? So, so I kind of look at uh, Mach 5 like, I mean, it's speed, right? So let's look at it like a plane, for instance. Most mm -hmm. of us have, have traveled in an airplane before. Now, the first thing about a plane is that, you know, it, it's sitting on the ground. And, and the thing that holds it to the ground is gravity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all of us have some gravity, some unknown, unseen force that is kind of holding us to where we are. A plane is not supposed to be on the ground. Any pilot will tell you that. The reason planes come and go and come and go and they change the crew and the plane comes and goes is that when a plane sits, it gets destroyed because that's not where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be up in the air. Mm -hmm. So when you are not flying at Mach 5, when you're not flying at all, you're on the ground. Yeah, it may be comfortable. You know, that's that that you don't like. Mm -hmm. But you're in it because mm -hmm. when you see the other jobs, you're like, 
I don't know if I can get there, you know, but at least, you know, that, that's when we come up with bread in the hand is more than, is worth more than two in the bush and so on and so forth. So all of us have this gravity that kind of holds us down. And that, I think, is, is what ties into the very first module of, you know, we are being held back, mm -hmm. all right? But then how does a plane get to fly? It starts to move. And in moving, it is starting to overcome gravity, okay? Mm -hmm. So it starts to move at a speed where it can now take advantage of the wind that is around it and it uses its own power to, to levitate itself above the force of gravity. But in order to do that, it must accept that it's a plane. Hmm. So it, it must see that, okay, I see all these planes flying around and I'm a plane too, so it means I can fly there. But I think most of us never come get to... to that point. Yeah, we never get to the point of accepting that, hey, this is me, okay. But then the downside is, you know, once a plane starts moving, then the forces against the plane actually increase. Because now you have like more wind, more dust, you know, if it's snowing, snow, if it's sand, you know, there's so many things that come against it. If you think about sitting in a plane, you know, at some point, the plane actually starts to shake and you're like, Charlie, what's happening to yeah, this plane? I can't jump out. <laughs> you know, you can't jump out. Okay. You know, and, and that's the point where it's sort of really pushing defiantly through all the things that are, that are fighting against it. And, you know, I'm sure the plane is probably thinking, you know, I was so much better off on the ground where the wind, the breeze was just blowing by. I didn't have any of these issues. But now that I've decided to fly, look at all this struggle. But then, you know, there always comes that point. There's like a final shudder in a plane and then it's quiet. Mm. It just comes to a place of, I'm good. Mm. And then it's flying. You know, it's, it's, mm. it's found it's... It's such a visual picture. <laughs> It's found its comfort zone and it's like, oh, I guess I am a plane after all, you know, uh -huh. I can do all of these things. But even then, that's not Mach 5. Because you know when you're flying, the pilot will tell you that, oh, you know, we are going to go to this altitude. Yeah, you're flying, but you're not flying at the level and at the speed that you can get to. Mm -hmm. And so flying at Mach 5 is when you come to that place where you say, okay, fine, I've kind of figured out how to fly, how to do this, how to be in this job, how to be in this space, how mm -hmm. to speak, how to yeah, draw, own how to voice, hone, you know, yeah. own my voice, how to just be myself. Now, how do I maximize that? Mm. How do I take it to a place where it's really valuable, mm -hmm. you know? And that's when you transition from a max speed to max five, where mm. you, are, you are doing, you are being the plane that you can be. You are being all that you can this be. This is powerful. I mean, it's good I made you talk about my <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about fly. And in the past month, um, month or two, yeah. you've been flying. You've been in Korea. You've been in the States. You've been in Rwanda, all talking and impacting. And yeah. Would you say you are flying at my <laughs> I, I would say I'm flying at... Max speed for sure. Okay. But I don't think I'm flying yet at Mach 5. Okay. I, I still feel within me. And I, you know, I think it's one of the things that your audience should, should ask themselves is, you know, you, you feel as if there's more. There's mm. more you can do. There's more you can be. You, you see other people do things and you think, I, I can do that. You know, but, but even better, you know, but there's something that's sort of like, uh, yeah, you know, kind of holding you back. And, I think I'm still working on coming to that place mm -hmm. of, there's a lot that I've been able to release. I mean, I, through you and with you, I've gone from being the plane that was on the ground to actually flying. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I still see that I have a bit more speed that I, that, that, that I can, that will take, take me to a place where I'm like, yeah, this is, this is good. So, so us, um, what were your inner barriers were? Mm. Oh, let, let me take two questions here. Sure. Answer whichever one you want to answer first. At what point did you feel that, you know, I'm not flying at Mach 5 mm. and there are inner barriers? And when you identified that, what were your inner barriers? Mm. Okay. Yes. So I think um, there were times when I would think about doing something and then I would convince myself to not do it because I wasn't good enough. I was, you know, I come with all these reasons why I shouldn't do it. And then later on, I'd either see someone do it or I would think it through and I'm like, I could have done this, you know, this is not a big deal. And it, it made me see that my, my biggest barrier really was just fear. Fear primarily around 
what people would say, what people would think. I mean, when you read my book, yeah. Broken for You, Broken the entirety you. of the book is, is about the fact that we spend too much time preoccupied with the opinions and the views of other people and that we all need to come to a point of having an audience of one where that audience is God. And so once we are living a life and flying at speeds that are pleasing to God, it doesn't matter what the rest of the world says, but it's a hard place to come to because we are all surrounded by people, yeah. that, you know, living and dead witnesses who, who are... Living and dead, <laughs> I like the dead ones. <laughs> <laughs> who have a lot of yeah. opinions and commentary about yeah. our life, you know. So that's so, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that takes me to um, when you became a priest, an Anglican yeah. priest, the seventh female. Yes, seventh female priest. Yes. Okay. What was the feeling like? What was the experience like? What has the challenges been in relation to flying at Mat Five? <laughs> so the biggest challenge was I felt like an imposter. An imposter. Yes, I remember having that conversation with you and, and you asked me, I said, well, I don't feel like a priest. And I remember you asked me, like, what do you think it's a, a priest is supposed to feel like? And I didn't even have an answer. <laughs> but I felt like an imposter because, you know, I had this image in my mind of, you know, a priest must have been crefe from jump. They should be I mean, a member of SU, AYPA, you know, <laughs> Methodist youth, you know, somebody who at least they should know the beginning of the Bible from the end, you know, that kind of stuff. And then along comes me, who is like, you know, rebel. I only go, when I go to church, you know, after communion, I walk out. If I go for communion, you know, I go to church, I drop my mother and I sit in the car as the church service is going <laughs> on. And I'm like, how did I end up? Becoming. Uh, becoming a priest. So initially I felt like an imposter. Um, I felt as if I didn't have the moral authority. But you know, one of the things you taught me was really about the concept of false humility. You know, so, so this idea of feeling like, like an imposter, feeling like we're not good enough, is actually reverse pride. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's still a focus on self. It's just a negative focus mm -hmm. on self. You know, so I realized that, look, I mean, on what basis would I say I don't have the moral authority? The word of God is not my word. You know, it is truth. Mm -hmm. And so speaking truth is a function of the truth, not a function of the person mm -hmm. who is speaking the truth. So while you yourself may not be able to accomplish something, it doesn't mean you can't tell somebody that this is the truth. I myself have failed, but this is the truth. And so, but, but there's always this impression that one's life must we all try to reflect the life of Christ, but there's always this um, impression, especially around priesthood, that the priest must be righteous above all others. And yes, the life of everybody, all of us are part of the royal priesthood. And so the lives of all of us must reflect the life of Christ. But when we place that level of righteousness upon priests, we make them God. Mm -hmm. We make them the person that we worship. And so you hear people say things like, you know, um, I have the covering of my priest. Like, how can you have the covering of your priest? Your priest is not God. You know, your priest is. Your, 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 your priest is, is not God. Is not God. Yeah. No, your priest yeah. is not God. God is God. Yeah. And all of us are, are striving to, to, to be more like God. So I struggled initially with the concept of, you know, how do you stay humble by recognizing that you are also a sinner? In as much as you are the person people are listening to to expose the word of God, you yourself are a sinner. You must always remain focused on the fact that you, have, you, you are all searching for salvation. So for me, it, it was the big challenge was mm -hmm. just overcoming that. But once I overcame that type of false pride of feeling like, oh, I must be the most righteous person and, you know, like the Pharisees, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I realized that, you know, I can just live and I can just be and I can share. That was what brought me to a place of comfort to share my story, to share my feelings, to let people know that You're yeah, vulnerable I, I'm vulnerable. Okay. I, haven't, I haven't gotten it right all the time. And that's okay because all of us are protected by God and, um, and, and we, we have equal access to him. You know, when Christ died, the veil tore. So we all have equal access to God. So for me, Priesthood has been a, a, a real growth journey for me as well. My own faith has been strengthened in the process of, of being a priest. You know, when you talk about vulnerability, and um, we are speaking to all kinds of people, yeah. but our focus has to do with people, with women, yes. in the ages of 45 to 65. 
So the word vulnerability, how do you understand it? Um, I'm looking at women and their vulnerability edges. Mm. Can you share with us some, as a priest, I know people like a counselor or a coach, people come here and they talk. Yes. What have you seen to be the major vulnerability edges of women between the ages of 45 to 65? Mm. So what I've seen is fear. Mm. It's, just, it's just a big fear of, fear of everything, fear of failure, fear of success, fear of what people will say, fear of what people will think, fear of what will happen. You know, just there's a constant feeling of I'm too afraid to step into this space that I feel like I'm, I'm ready to step into. Mm -hmm. So in the time that I've done counseling, well, I mean, I still continue to counsel mm -hmm. people. I've just tried to get them to see that, you know, that fear should be embraced. I, I always tell people that till today, I am nervous to the point of nausea whenever I have to preach. But I have learned to leverage it, and I've learned to look forward to it. And when I don't feel that nervousness, I become worried because it's become my crutch. It's become the thing that I know. I know that when I'm afraid, then I know that what will happen will have to be God because I can't get this done. You know, so that fear shouldn't be looked at as a negative. The, the vulnerability should be looked at as a, um, a call, a call to, to depend mm. and, and a call to, to, to potential greatness because it is there. It is a reminder of the fact that we are only human. The, the other thing that I think vulnerability does for us is, at least exposing our vulnerability, is that it allows us to control the narrative. One of our biggest fears is always what people will say. People, people will say, say this about me. You know, so yeah. if you say it, then it's done. There's nothing else to say, you know. <laughs> when you say what people say, was there a point in your own life that you were taking a particular decision to be able to help you fly at Mat five that you were afraid of what people would say? And oh, yes. What did you do at that time? Um, I was very worried about becoming a priest because of what people would say. Um, you know, for me, going into priesthood was, was not, it, it wasn't something I wanted to do. I mean, you know the story. But... And I saw God literally dismantle my life and bring me to a point of, okay, right now, this is your only choice. Mm. You know, but what the world saw was you failed, and so now you're going to become a priest because you can't think what of it. What you say dismantle my life? Dismantle is for us. Uh, well, I mean... What did you, my, what did my, you do at that time to dismantle your life? My, um, I mean, you know, I, I'd, I'd gone through a divorce. My marriage had fallen apart. Mm -hmm. um, that was really hard on me. Uh, when I came back here, I couldn't set up a business, career was falling apart. You know, everything, I, I literally was, I lost, sold my house at a loss because the, 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 um, the, States. the in the States, yeah. because the markets had collapsed. So literally everything that I had spent the first half of my life building up came down to nothing. Scratch, nothing. I, I just had nothing at all. Not physical, not emotional, nothing. You know, and I remember some, I think I told you this, that somebody called me and said to me that, look, he, he, he'd had a, a, a dream or a vision, something, where God had said to him that he's clearing the field of my life mm. because everything that has been planted was not planted by him. Mm. And so he's clearing it and he's going to replant it. And it's taken a long time to build back up, but it's built up um, very organically, very beautifully, um, with minimal pain. <laughs> I mean, true restoration, the way God restores, you know, so yeah. <laughs> wow. So I'm looking at, um, I'm visualizing flying at Mach 5. Yeah. And I'm visualizing a situation where uh, when I'm flying, I'm seeing people down. Mm. Okay. And when I'm flying, I'm bringing people, I'm, I'm expanding to various territories. Yeah. Okay, I'd, I'd like you to relate this to the, the, the importance of getting to that stage of flying at Mach 5. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, the importance of it, at the end of the day, when, when we think about our lives, I don't think the purpose of anyone's life is just to be successful. You know, It's good to be successful, but I don't think God wants to bring us to a place of, you are just the biggest and the best. To what end? Mm -hmm. You know, It is it brings you to a point of benefiting other people. 
I related to the story in Luke where um, Jesus had helped Peter get all these fish, okay? And, you know, other people actually had to come in and, and benefit from it, okay? In the same way, when Jesus calmed the storm, there were other boats on the lake, you know? So there's always a benefit to, to, the, to the, the blessing that you receive and to your ability to fly at that level. And I think one of the things that the foundation that I run, mm -hmm. um, where it yeah. says um, our byline is a fairer world, mm -hmm. is that when you are flying at Mach 5, you know, you're at that level where you, you, you've got it, okay? You can bring other people up and it doesn't affect your speed. It doesn't affect your speed. Wow. It, it doesn't, you, you don't, you don't, so if anything, you speed up, you know, you don't slow down by helping other people up. And that's what we focus to do, focus on at uh, the foundation that I run yeah. is helping young people to figure out, look, what are you passionate about? How can Tell you Tell us be... more about the foundation. Sure. So it's called Equitas. Mm -hmm. My line is a fairer world. And the idea is that there are so many young people who finish university and they're not employable. Yes, we know we have an employment challenge, but there's also an employability issue mm -hmm. because many of our young people have no idea why they studied what they studied. Hmm. <laughs> they, um, they, they've not been equipped to survive in a, in a corporate space, mm -hmm. you know, so fundamentals of, you know, showing up on time, integrity, critical thinking, self-awareness, all of those things are things that are not taught in our universities. Yeah. And so we are saying to them, listen, guys, it's great you have a degree, but you know, after they clapped for you the day you got your degree, that was kind of the end of it. <laughs> that was kind of the end of it. Now, what do you need to take you to that next level? And all of us, I mean, you, me, all of us are a function of whose shoulders we've stood on. You know, I mean, I've had the opportunity to stand on your shoulders for you to teach me mm -hmm. things that allow you and I to speak as colleagues now, rather I have than stood on your shoulders <laughs> as we train together. Yeah. As, we, as we train together, exactly. Yeah. So. The foundation is all about now that people like you and me have gotten to that level, mm -hmm. how do we bring other people up? Mm, how, do we, how do we encourage other young people to, to start flying at that level so that when they are our age, they, they too can help other young people to come up? So we do that through internship opportunities, mm -hmm. and uh, we have our big concert coming up on the 4th of December. Which yeah, 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 that's yes, what the yes. annual, yeah. We have an yeah. annual concert, it's yeah. a classical music concert where um, we raise funds for these young people. It's three years running now, and it's been amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm allowing you to share this because it's all about flying at Mach 5. Yes. You begin to impact. Yes. You begin to ask yourself, what can I give back? Yeah. Yep, okay, yep, yep. because when you're flying, you are seeing so many, <laughs> you begin to choose. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, you begin yes. to choose. You begin because to choose. I'm saying yeah. that too, because as an engineer, you know how you transitioned. You've done three masters. Is it three masters you have? <laughs> 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 and yes, three masters. You worked at um, Bost, yeah. as a manager there. You, so when you look back, what have you drawn? What are you drawing from the field of engineering? Because somebody would say, okay, um, I've worked <laughs> for several years as a manager somewhere and now you want me, you know. So what can you draw from your engineering field mm -hmm. to impact at the level of uh, Mach 5? What can you draw from your experience as all the things you're doing mm -hmm. for, for the youth as a, as a reverend? I was going to say pastor, <laughs> but I know it doesn't. <laughs> uh -huh. So tell us bits and pieces of what you have drawn, you, you have put together. Yeah and which is helping you, even though you haven't gotten there yet, you're on the journey to fly at Mach 5. Mm -hmm. For me, days. I mean, when I look at engineering, engineering taught me to think in a particular way. So I think in very basic terms, you know, how do you build up? Because that's all an engineer looks for is, what's the base unit and how do you build up? Okay. And that is how I explain everything. So engineering has really helped me. I mean, most people who listen to me preach, talk about the fact that it's very simple and they understand it. It's just because, that's how I'm trained. I'm mm -hmm. trained to go to the base level and build up a story from there. So that's been a, a huge pull for me. I've been a Toastmaster, so of course mm -hmm. I love doing Toastmaster stuff. Um, I didn't know I loved writing. And you know, that's part of what the foundation is about, is exposing mm -hmm. people to the things that they love. Mm -hmm. you know, so when I was done writing, I, one of our old teachers um, 
I forget her name, <laughs> but English teacher. English teacher. Uh -huh. But she read the book, and she oh. said, "Oh, you know, you, you've um, you've always written well." And I thought, "Oh, really?" And she mm. said, "Yeah." And she sent me an essay. And you wrote that I wrote in GIS. I, in GIS, and I said, "Why do you have this essay?" She said, "Oh, this is the sample essay we use to show students oh, what wow. a good essay is." And, and I'm here, I'm thinking, I was like, "Oh, I didn't even know I could write." You know, it never once crossed my mind. I was writing a book, you know, but. It didn't strike me that writing was something that was, mm -hmm. you know, was, was a, a gift that I have. So all of these things I've kind of brought in and um, it's helped me to be able to also demonstrate to young people that, look, you don't always get it right. I mean, if I had known this was the direction of my life, I don't think I would have done engineering and all these other things. But you see, God knows yeah. the things he needs us to do and experience so that he can use us as tools in his hands the way he wants us to. So I'm always telling young people that, look, yeah, you may not have done a degree that you liked, but you can still get into what it is that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And that degree can, um, can support you in other ways. But transferable skills, yeah. it's not just about the actual degree. When I worked at BOST, you know, everybody talks about the fact that I'm an engineer and I worked at BOST. I was, in, I was a general manager at BOST. I was in high level management. Mm -hmm. Never did I pick up a screwdriver or a <laughs> bolt or do anything. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't even, when, in my interaction with the engineers, I was talking about contents of employment and, you know, issues and you, none of it was about engineering. I understood the but work they were doing, but I drew yes. from my engineering experience to be able to relate to them and have these, the, the mm -hmm. conversations that I did with them. So everything is transferable. I don't think there's anything we learn that is a waste and mm. can't be used anywhere else. Yeah. So no regrets? No regrets. None whatsoever. I mean, no, no way. None. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't change anything. This, wow. is, this, this is the way so it's So two things. To you, you, um, one, I'd like you to share with us how coaching has helped you mm. as a person. And then I'd like you to share with us how flying at Mark 5, you are able to draw your daughter and draw <laughs> because it's as if you are you are able to draw all of them yeah. with you so the two first so how has coaching helped you how are you able to draw the people draw the people around yes you? your family yeah. Your, okay. your, yeah. yeah so coaching has been phenomenal for me you know i i hadn't experienced any kind of coaching before um i met with you i didn't realize it forced me to face myself you know, I, I remember the last coaching session we had, we were sitting on a bus. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you asked me, you said, envision a kua and tell me what you see. And I remember telling you that, oh, she's tired and she's this and she's that. And you asked me, why are you not protecting her? You know, for me, it, it, it's been that ability to take my spirit or my emotions and, and set them aside and look at them and have a, do an honest assessment mm -hmm. of self and say, this is going well, this is not going well. And coaching has also taught me that it's a journey. You know, because I'm an engineer, I'm very project-based, and I used to feel like I must get here, yeah, and I must be here, there must be a result, I must be here, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I've learned that, you know, today is the best I am today, and tomorrow I'll be better. And I can't take tomorrow and look back and say, oh, today was a waste because I'm not as good as I was, as I will be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I've come to, coaching has helped me to, to really accept myself and also to accept other people and to see where other people are in their journey. And that brings me to your second question, which is, you know, bringing them up. Because mm -hmm. in, in coaching, I've learned to be compassionate to myself. I think a lot of times, when we talk about forgiveness and compassion and love, we think of it externally, mm. loving other people. But if you think about the Trinity, they loved mm. themselves first. God loved himself first before he loved any of us. Yes, that's... Because it is only in his love that he can give love. And when Christ says, love your neighbor as yourself, if you don't love yourself, it is absolutely impossible to love your neighbor. You know, so... For me, it's been compassion, being able to see that this is where my daughter is and yelling at her to be 20 years away from now, it, it's not compassion. You know, it, it's recognizing that in this space, at this time, this is where you are mm -hmm. and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Places you can get to, we can have those conversations 
And I do that with all the stuff that we have around. So yeah. just snippets of lessons, you know, sort of water cooler training moments yeah. where you, you see something and you say, hey, look, you know, this thing, if you do it like this, that's what will help you. You know, and just snippets, but also the example of your life. I, I listened to my daughter, someone, she asked someone a question and the person said, I can't remember what the answer was, but she said, I need to know whether it's a yes or a no. And you know, she said to the, person, said to the, I the person, I need to know. And you know, that was so <laughs> me. You know, I was like, oh goodness. Poor that was child. so you. I know, yes. that's very me. Like, okay, yeah. dude, let's, Black or white, let's no, define nothing. this, you know, yes. all this shadiness, you know. But it just struck me that what you do, the people around you pick up on it. You know, so it's important that in as much as we all fail and we're all vulnerable, that we strive to be the very best we can do, be. Because sometimes the example of our life is the only hope somebody has, you know. We don't even have to speak to them, but just watching us, they're like, wow, I can do that too. Wow. You know, recently um, I, there was a, a program we wanted to do, and um, one guy made a comment. He said it had to do with smart, successful women, you mm -hmm. know. And she said, but these women, they are smart, they are successful. Well, they don't need anything. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, that triggered a lot, mm. you know, of society's perception of women who have gotten to a certain height and as a result of society's perception, how it impacts on their behavior and, and their choices. And what do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you a Kita School Boys story. Kita School Boys. Kita School okay. Boys. Uh -huh. So one of my favorite people in this world is a guy who brings me Kita School Boys to supplement my dog food. Now, this is a person who, you know, in his mind, you know, what do I need? Mm. Yeah, I don't need anything. But, but he assessed and came up with guitar school boys and make sure that I constantly get this, this supply of, um, of guitar school boys. Mm -hmm. And I think many of us work on the premise that, you know, people dress nicely, they have a nice car, they have a nice bag, you know, it's like, oh, you know, what can I give them that they would appreciate? Yeah. But all of us, especially the more successful you become, it's about love. It's not about um, the thing that you receive. Mm -hmm. It's about the fact that somebody thought about you, assessed your life, and, and determined that you have a particular need. Yes, I can afford guitar school, but it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he thought, hey, let me bring that to you, because it's a nice thing to do. I think too many of us are not compassionate enough to recognize that People just want to be loved. At the end of the day, everybody just wants to be loved. They want to feel significant. They want to feel respected. And we, we each need to stop this notion of it is the poor and downtrodden who need, but those who, who have become successful in life don't need anything. Yes, it may not be a material thing that you actually need, but the idea that someone thought about you mm -hmm. to give you something it means the world. It, 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 it's a thing I look forward to all the time because I know it's a sign of care. And most of us as women in this position, we just want someone to care about us. Hmm. Okay, now there's a question I want to ask. Yes. You want somebody to care about us. You want to become your best self. You know, sometimes people feel that in the bid for women to become their best self, they want to become... Um, uh, like women's liberation, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, do, do you, how do you, what would you say about the whole package mm. of becoming my best self? Okay. The whole package, when you look at the modules, and I'll run through the modules, sure, sure, just sure. for you to see how you can tie them in. So the, the modules, we have um, releasing my fears, mm -hmm. we have loving myself, we have um, owning my voice and visibility, we have authentic confidence then we have um, we have stepping into my purpose contribution mm. we have flying at Mach 5 yeah. take them and, and tell me so, how so I'm going to hone in on just two of them okay I'm going to hone in on owning your own voice and being authentic especially as women you know there's always this tendency or uh, sense of to be a woman who is successful in this world, which is clearly male-dominated, you essentially have to become a man hmm. or something <laughs> close to a man. But 
I think not. I, I found that um, all of us need to pick our battles. Yes, there will always be men who will be chauvinistic, but there are many men who are not. Um, but we, we need to bring who we are to the table because if all men put together had gotten it right, there wouldn't be a need for any woman to come to the table. So the value a woman brings is not abandoning herself outside of the door, coming in and adopting a person who she's not and trying to portray who that person is. So I think as women, yes, it is important that as women we fight for the liberation of women. But at the same time, in fighting for the liberation of women, we shouldn't lose the woman in the process. Mm. I mean, the woman's door should still be open for her by the man because that's his <laughs> job in life, you know. Uh -huh. um, I, I always make the comment that if you're in a boardroom and a gentleman says to you, can you make me a cup of tea? At that point, you need to make a determination. Will I gain from making him this cup of tea? If yes, sure, make it. If not, then don't. You know, it shouldn't be about, you know, is it because you think I'm a woman? You know, it should the, just be no, about... The meaning we give. Exactly. We shouldn't give it any meaning. A person wants a cup of tea. He's asked another person to give him a cup of tea. Does the person think it is value add to do so? If yes, do so. If not, don't. You know, but assess it, you know, because women should be strategic. You know, if this guy who's asking for a cup of tea is the person who can be a decision maker, who can shift, he's a thought leader in the board, make him tea and ask, add some crumpets. I know, give him some biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> but if he's a follower who is a no value add and you don't feel like making the tea, don't make the tea, you know. But don't let it be about you. Oh, because I'm a woman. We, we should be far more strategic than that and less petty about um, fighting for, 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 for respect, which may not necessarily have been earned. I think it's important that we, we put our best foot forward mm -hmm. and we, we demonstrate that there's value, there's a reason God, upon looking at all his creation, determined that a woman is missing and so I'm going to add a woman. If he felt that he just needed to create more men, he would have done that. Mm -hmm. But he felt that I need to add estrogen to this, this, this formula yeah, to, make it, <laughs> to, make it, to make it to make it better. And so we should bring forth our femininity, uh, rather than deny it in an effort to be more like men. Then you talked about owning your voice. And so owning your voice, exactly. So the same thing as in who you are, you know, speak that truth. Not everybody's going to agree with it. I mean, and that's okay. Not everybody's required to agree with it. And I think sometimes as women, we, we, we have this impression that once we have said it, it should be agreed with. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be. We, we, we've put it out in the universe and it's there. And those who will buy into it will buy into it. And those who won't, won't. And that's okay because most things are like that. Hardly is there anything that everybody, everybody buys, into. buys into. And it's not a function of being a woman. It's just a function of being human. But we should own who that is. Whether the world agrees with it or not. We shouldn't deny ourselves just for the purposes of receiving accolades and approval hmm. from people. So, my last two questions. <laughs> oh, the first is um, the masterclass yeah. that will be running on, on flying. At <laughs> what, what are people to expect? It will be very much similar to the story I gave, you yeah. know, that where are we now? What's this ground we are on now? Um, or even if we are flying, what is it? What's tethering us? To the level or the speed we are at now, mm -hmm. it's just true self-reflection and asking oneself, what is holding me back? Mm -hmm. What is preventing me from getting to where I want to go to? The other thing is we can expect is understanding where it is that we want to go to. Mm -hmm. I think many of us just want to succeed, and almost none of us can define what that su that success even looks like. You know, it's, oh, I just want to be great, great like how, like. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we need to have clarity and, and success is not the same for everybody, you know. So, so we must, in, in self-recognition, in recognizing what is holding us back, we must also recognize where can we get to. Because sometimes what is holding us back is divine. We can't get beyond it. It's mm -hmm. just what it is. That's just who we are. That's our level in life. And it's okay. That is our highest success point. So having hit that highest success point, whether it is the highest possible or the lowest possible. Once we have hit our success, we must now ask ourselves, how do I shift to significance? 
how do I, how does how can my success impact other people mm -hmm. so that you know upon the the, 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 the lips of babes they, they will speak of who I am and what I did whatever that level was you know so that we will leave the master class recognizing what is holding us back mm -hmm. recognizing where we want to go to and truly accepting self and knowing that in hitting our peak whatever that may be yeah. we still have a step further to go which is to influence other Others. people yeah. wow hmm. finally <laughs> you know finally I, I i am honored to have my 35 34 years <laughs> students counselor i mean I just even don't know what to say now and the fact that you are a reverend Equa, and you are the last to speak yeah. on this uh, tele summit which has had six women speaking mm, ahead mm, of you. Mm. I'd like you as a reverend to dedicate this whole Becoming My Best Self um, package, coaching package for smart, successful women between the ages of 45. Somebody asked me, why not 40? <laughs> and, and for me, the interesting thing is there are stages as a career consultant. I know that there are stages in human development. Mm. And at the age when you hit 40, that 45, the 35s and the 50s, 40s are trying to make it in life. That's when they want to really get a name. And, but when you hit 45, 65, that space, a lot of things, shifts okay. And many times you find that we don't have a place to go to yeah. at that stage. A lot of things happen at that stage. You're still using development. <laughs> and you want to give back, but you don't know how to give back. Yeah. You want to release yourself of certain things you don't know how to do. It. So I deliberately took that age. Now I'd like you to dedicate this for us before we close. And so I leave it to you. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to use the scripture where Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say I am? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think all of us come to that point in our life where we ask, who do they say I am? If I, if I were to leave this world today, what would be the story? Mm -hmm. Would it be, would I have fulfilled my mission? And I believe that was why Jesus Christ was asking that question. And ultimately, that was when uh, Peter answered by saying, you are the Messiah, which was affirmation for Christ that his work has not been in vain. He's been able to establish clearly, if in, at least in one person's mind, that this is who he is, the Messiah. And so each of us must come to a place through this program where we can ensure that we're able to clearly define who we are and what our legacy is. Okay. And so let us pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for, for this brilliant idea that you've given your handmaids to help women between 45 and 65 to become their very best self, to become, the, to become who you said they are to be, very best self, the self that you put in them, the self that is you yourself. Father, for all the various modules and for all the women who will be teaching these modules, we plead the blood of your son Jesus Christ over them and ask that your Holy Spirit be poured out on each of them. Bless the word of their mouths. May every word that they speak be your truth and your truth alone. May the words that they speak ride upon the wings of angels and into the hearts of the women who will listen to these sessions the women who will attend these master classes. May this be a revolution, a total shift from the way women in their mid-40s and above have perceived themselves, that each of us as women will come to a place where we know who we are in you and we will live out our fullest lives, not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify you. We thank you for the life of Sika, for the entire crew that has made this happen, for all the people who are going to teach and lecture. And we dedicate this program in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And all the angels said amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome, Thank you. God bless you. <laughs>